All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight here at Lighthouse Discipleship Center. My name is Dave Everett. This is my wife, Sherry. And anyway, we, we, we welcome you and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to be continuing our Bible study on the New Year of the Holy Spirit by Andrew Womack. We're actually in the second half of the book now on the, uh, the Holy Spirit. We'll be in chapter 13 tonight, uh, titled Proof for the Day. Uh, in, the, in the second section, uh, Whom Do You Believe? Whom Do You Believe? So anyway, uh, if you'd like to watch our previous sessions, we have those uh, archived on our uh, website, Lighthouse Discipleship. Uh, org, as well as our YouTube channel, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. You can also uh, donate and support our ministry that's now worldwide. Uh, and so uh, through our uh, website, Lighthouse Discipleship Center. And we thank you for those who have done that. Anyway, uh, we are getting there at the end. We still have about four chapters left, including the chapter we're on. And then we're going to start a new Bible study on Wednesday nights called Believer's Authority. So we're still a little ways away from that. These chapters are a little short, so that's why I'm already starting to announce it. Um, but anyway, um, so again, we're, we're uh, talking about the New Year and the Holy Spirit, specifically the Holy Spirit tonight. We're in chapter 13 on Proof of the Day. This is actually... actually uh, following the chapter of speaking in tongues. So it's, it's still kind of on that subject a little bit of speaking in tongues. And I know that's kind of like the elephant in the room. That's that's where people uh, can be the most uh, hung up on, the most uh, uncomfortable with. And I think that there's a number of reasons for that. One, there's been abuse out there. And two, there's been a lack of teaching. You know, when you don't know something, you can be confused. And you can be that uneasy about something. Uh, there's a... There's a a sense of fear that comes in when you don't know something, and so and they, and they, hey, where you just there's just been some weird stuff out there, and I'm not trying to put anyone down or anything. Uh, and some of that's been because of lack of teaching. Some of it's not. Some of it's uh, just rebellious. Uh, and to be to be blunt, but at, at some point in time, uh, it just uh, anyway. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the negative stuff. I'm talking about we want to speak the truth and. Uh, and Jesus taught it, the apostles taught it, believed in it, and I, I, I want everything God has for me. So Sherry's going to read for us, she's going to narrate, and then we'll talk about it. So we're in chapter 13, proof for today, and there's a section, Whom Do You Believe? Chapter, uh, page 92, if you have the book with us. So. I started talking about the Lord once to a woman whose house I was painting. When she asked me why I had left the Baptist church, I told her that they kicked me out after I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Are you talking about speaking in tongues, she inquired. Yes, that's part of it. I do speak in tongues, and that's why they asked me to leave the church. She thought for a moment and then politely added, Well, my church would have kicked you out too. <laughs> I asked, Why would they do that? And showed her 1 Corinthians 14, 39. The Bible clearly says here, Forbid not to speak with tongues. I'll, I've never forgotten her candid reply. Well, there are lots of things in the Bible our church doesn't believe. With that, I knew I couldn't minister to her anymore because God's word was not the final authority in her Christian life. She, like so many others, had chosen to believe her denomination's doctrine above God's word. This is why 1 Corinthians 14 remains the most misunderstood passage of Scripture regarding the gifts of the Holy Spirit today. All right, uh, thank you, Sherry. I know that's our brief, uh, so there's just a little uh, broke there about what do you believe. <coughs> you know, we, and Sherry and I have come across this with some churches we've been a part of, uh, and, and we want to be a part of them very long. Uh, I'm not so much talking about the church I grew up or anything, and, and I'm not so much sure about Sherry's past in this, but... Uh, there was a, a church that we went to for a brief period of time because we had didn't have a car and, and it was it was walking distance. It's not a church we would have chosen, but it, the church that we could go to. We wanted fellowship and and uh, we went there trying to rebolt the church. And, uh, you know, if the Holy Spirit Jesus can't change the church, well, who do you think he's going to be? <laughs> and so uh, you know that's not our job. Our job is not to serve the pastor. And uh, he's the pastor of the church, even if we disagree with him. You know, if you don't agree with the pastor, just leave. And that's the simplest way. Andrew teaches on that. He taught on that briefly uh, a couple of years ago when we were at a conference in Phoenix with him. But anyway, um, you know, uh, but I do want to piggyback on this point. You know, uh, when someone doesn't believe that the scriptures, the word of God, is God's final, is, is a full, final authority on the matter, 
or any matter. It's hard, almost hard to even debate or have a discussion with them because I believe the Word of God is the final authority. And someone who, who I'm having a discussion or argument, not every argument is bad. You know, sometimes we can have a constructive argument and it can be actually fruitful. Uh, the court systems, when they operate properly, it's an argument. You know, there's two sides of, 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 of the equation and, and it can be done constructively. Um, so I don't mind having that argument, discussion, a disagreement with somebody, but when it becomes hostile, when it becomes violent, when it becomes mean and malicious, uh, that, that, you know. But it's hard to reason with somebody who doesn't believe that Scripture is the final authority. When someone says, like this gal said to Andrew, our church doesn't believe everything about the Bible. Now, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with some people who want to omit certain parts of the Scripture. <laughs> I just, I just, right off the, because that's the foundation for me. That's that, and, and if we're going to start cutting out scriptures, then, you know, I, uh, the word of God is not the ink. The word of God is the person. So you're cutting out parts of Jesus that you're saying you don't want. And I have an issue with that. And so uh, it's, it's going to be hard to reason with them. You know, they, if people don't believe God's word is a, the final authority, then uh, there's hardly anything to talk about. Now, there's also another issue, uh, other perspective of that is that sometimes people believe in the Word of God, but we have different perceptions of that. We have different understandings of that. We have different teachings on that. We also there are prior churches, and some of them were the same church I was talking about, where I even had the pastor tell me, Dave, you're right. I, you're, everything you're saying is right, because this church didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. It was for the day. They didn't believe in the gifts. They didn't believe in healing uh, for the day. And he, he, you know, he told me, Dave, you're right, but I can't teach this because our denomination won't let me. That's the fear of man. The Bible says the fear of man is a snare. And so uh, that's the fear of man instead of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God. The fear of the Lord is respecting him, honoring him. And if you will honor the word, the, the word of a denomination or a pastor or a person for that matter, over God's word, the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. You know, and so I didn't say that. God's word said that. And so, um, anyway, I just have an issue with those who want to come out of scripture. But at the same point in time, <clears throat> you know, what do you believe? You know, there was a time back in 2009, I had just been introduced to Andrew Womack, and this was the book I read, Believe in Authority, on that. And uh, long story short, um, you know, I, I, I was at a, some crossroads in my life and just my belief system, and I just said, uh, you know, I was hearing some different doctrines. Some of them were not good, were good, some not so good. Some were, you know, uh, I wasn't sure on. And I finally got to the point where I was ask, I began to ask myself this one question. And uh, what do I believe and why do I believe it? Do I believe what I believe because I've always been taught that? Or do I believe what I believe because I can, because I can give you a, a, a chapter and verse and I can tell you why I believe it scripturally? I was asking myself that question. I grew up in a good Christian home. I grew up in, 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 in good churches. But I finally, I, I had to ask myself, what do I believe? And why do I believe it? Do I believe it because my pastors have always taught that or our parents taught me that? And don't disrespect it any of them because they've all, they've all done well. But at the same point in time, you know, uh, do I believe what I believe because that's what I was taught to believe? Or do I believe because I believe it because I believe it? Because I can, I can, I can use the scripture on that, you know. And and I, there's, there's still subjects today, even as a pastor. Being, in, I've been in ministry for almost 27, 28 years now, total, uh, not all at the same time, but at the same point in time, there's still things I'm not very comfortable teaching on because I don't have a full revelation on it yet. I don't have a stance on it, and uh, and some and some of the stances are are may not, you know, I'm just not comfortable teaching it. It's not a revelation I have yet fully. But I do have a revelation on righteousness. I do have a revelation on uh, the Holy Spirit and different things. And, and so, and I will teach it. Uh, and I have a revelation on the body of Christ and different things. I will teach it. You know, I could teach for hours. I could teach hours and hours for weeks, for months. I could go on till the cows come home. And uh, I could be like Paul where he was preaching so late that a guy fell out the window. They had to have a resurrection service. And, you know, and then they just kept preaching. He continued preaching. I, I could do that. Why? Because I, the Word of God, I'm just so full of the Word of God. Not because I'm someone special, and I'm not, not special, but I'm not more special than you, that's my point. It's just, I'm just full of the Word of God. And 
you know, you get me in, the, in, a, in some social groups, and I've been there, uh, where all I want to talk about is sports, this and that, and I'm, I, don't, I don't have anything against any of those things in and of themselves. But I don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> I don't even know who's playing. I don't know who's who. I don't, partly, quite frankly, no disrespect, but I don't really care <laughs> about uh, a lot of that stuff. I don't think it's wrong in and of itself. I don't think it's evil. I don't think it's wrong to talk about. I don't think it's wrong to enjoy or play or, or watch or, or whatever. I just don't have any interest in it. But you, you get me around a group that wants to talk scripture, wants to talk, have a positive, friendly conversation, even even if it's a disagreement, but it's still a positive, friendly disagreement. I can, I'll can talk for hours of why I believe what I believe, because I've been studying it. And, and, and I, I'm just piggybacking on that. I, I can take what I just said to any subject, let alone just speaking in tongues and the Holy Spirit. It's important that we know what we believe and why we believe it. Not because so-and-so said it. I don't want to just take speaking in tongues and the Holy Spirit because Andrew said it. I want to use scripture. When I first got introduced to Andrew reading Believer's Authority, I, I paused at all the scriptures and I looked them up myself. I read Joseph Prince's book, uh, I'm Married to Favor. And all the scriptures were in the back. He, he put them in all the scriptures in the back. And I didn't like that so much, but that's okay. That's the way he decided to write, write it. Uh, so I had to pause, flip to the back, get the scripture, look it up. And I, I, I wanted to, I, I didn't want to just take Joseph Prince's word for it or Andrew Walmack's word for it. I want to take God's word for it. You know, there's a verse in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 17, where Paul is uh, giving a compliment to the church of Thessalonica. I think it was Thessalonica. But he says, these people, uh, and I'm just going to paraphrase it, with the spirit of readiness, I'll come back to that phrase, they search the scriptures for themselves to see if these things be so. We should search the scriptures to see if the things that we're teaching, your pastor or any pastor, any teacher is so. But they didn't, they didn't do it with a spirit of critique. They didn't do it with a critical spirit. They did it with a spirit of readiness. Like that's, that's different. That's an attitude. With a spirit of readiness, willing to listen. You know, the Bible says in James 3 that the, the wisdom that's from above is willing to be entreated. We need to be willing to be entreated. But, uh, but they did, they search the scriptures to see if they'd be so. And if what I'm teaching, what the is, is, or Andrew's teaching on the Holy Spirit, or we're teaching, uh, is not in the Word of God, then throw it out the window, you know? But if what you're teaching, if what you say, if what you believe is not found in the Word of God, then I encourage you, I exhort you in love, throw that thought out the window. Jesus said, by your, your traditions, you make the Word of God of no effect. And some people, their belief systems are traditional because they only got it from their denomination. They only got it from their pastor. They only got it from their parents. But they have never searched the scriptures for themselves. And, uh, and that's wrong. That's dangerous. That's unhealthy. That's not good. Uh, you know, and so uh, we, 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 the Bible said we can ju judge also. We can judge these things. Not, we're not judging the person. We're judging the teaching. And so that's a whole other subject. I'm not going to go into all that right now. But anything you want to pick back on? Uh, no, I just agree with, with Andrew and Dave. You know, we do need to know what we believe. And there are some foundational beliefs that we really need to know and believe with all our heart. We need to know that Jesus died on the cross for us, why he died on the cross for us, who he died on the cross for, that he did die he was buried, he did rise again, and he is seated at the right uh, hand of God in heaven. We need to know that. We need to believe that. We need to know that Jesus raised from the dead, because if we don't, everything is in vain. We can believe that he was a good man and he died for us. Great, but that's not the whole story. We need Without resurrection from the dead, everything would be pointless. Uh, I, I, I can go further on, but I, I want to keep on topic because I know we need to, to know more things. But there are some foundational things. We need to know what we believe. And I love Dave's testimony of uh, just, he, he just wanted to sit down and study and study and study to, yes, you know, we, we do need to sit under good teaching, good teachers, uh, good men and women of God. 
because they are there for the body of Christ. Uh, God gave specific people gifts, the fivefold ministry, to minister to, to all of us. But we, not only is that that good, but we need to know what we believe. You know, Dave sat down, he's like, you know, what Andrew said is good, what, what Joseph said is good, but I need to know what I believe. And he came out stronger. And, and you know, the, the church that he, he uh, commended and Paul commended that they searched the scripture th themselves because uh, they wanted to see what Paul and the other people were teaching, if, if it w was true. And, um, you know, taking someone's word for it, it has, has some merit, but it doesn't, it's not the best thing. And it's not the final authority. The, right. But God's word, Andrew's main point is we need to believe God's word above anything else. And that is very true. Do you want to believe what your neighbor down the street said about you uh, in anger because maybe you accidentally ran into his car or something? Or do you want to believe what God's word says about you, what God says about you, that you're not a loser, that you're not stupid, God made you for a purpose, you are accepted in the beloved. What do you believe? Do you believe God's word or someone else's word? Do you even believe what you say about yourself or what God says about you? We, we need to know what we believe. And I also, real quick, want to piggyback, you know, Dave talked about you know, go, going to a good church, but, you know, if, if there's wrong teaching, then, you know, you do have the, the freedom to leave. Uh, but be careful with that. Because just because you don't like someone, you don't like how a pastor teaches or his style or something personal about someone in the church, that's not a good reason to leave the church. If, if the Holy Spirit is leading you to go to a church because there is... A benefit for the body of Christ for you to benefit them and bless them as well as for them to bless you even though the church isn't perfect we, we need to keep that in mind there's no perfect church there's no you know, perfect pastor we the church that Dave referred to uh, that didn't believe in healing in the Holy Spirit we loved the people and we were there for however long it was I don't have the dates in front of me I never wrote them down but we uh, encouraged the pastor. We supported the pastor and the leadership. Uh, we went to different Bible studies, uh, fellowships, different things. Because at the time, that's where we were to go. Because we knew the benefit of, of fellowshipping with the local body of church, of body of Christ. Yet there have been times we've gone to a church, gone in, and just something in our spirit just didn't feel right and there was a blatant uh wrong teaching you know that that's that's pretty evident you're not to to stay there um just rely on the holy spirit he will give you peace on to stay or not stay uh but i encourage you don't be immature and just well i don't like this church this person offended me and move on or something about the pastor or i don't like this point um Again, we're never going to find a perfect church. And if you're going to look for something bad, you're going to find it. But, again, uh, church is beneficial. Uh, so don't just use any excuse to leave a church. Um, you know, Lawson Purdue, one of our pastors, uh, he said, when you have sheep, you're going to have manure. So, uh, you know, and I know that I'm not trying to be crude with that, but it's just, you know, you're not going to have perfect people. You're not going to have a perfect pastor. You know, any any pastor can have an off Sunday. Any pastor could have an awesome Sunday and then uh, multiple uh, okay Sundays. You know, uh, you might not agree with everything. You might not, uh, uh, but don't, you know, I, I, and probably I was too quick with saying that. I'm just talking about what, uh, my comment. Let me just rephrase that. You know, if, if the pastor's like really off, I mean, they're just in, blatant sin or whatever the case may be it is not your job to confront that pastor and Andrew's very firm on that uh, you know if there's something of sin with Andrew that is not your job uh, and he said the best way for you to do that is just leave in a situation that's just 
that might be immoral or whatever the case may be, uh, and unethical. But just because, you know, and, you know, this has always been a little pet peeve of mine. Some people only pick a church what they can get out of it. But they don't consider so much what they can contribute. You're not going to go to a pastor and lead. You're not going to go to a pastor and be in leadership. I mean, okay, you're, gonna, you're not going to start out at a new church in leadership. No good pastor is going to put you in leadership right away. It's going to take time for you to grow and be a part of that church. I'll take someone as a pastor who's been faithful. That's my biggest thing I look for, faithfulness. I'm not looking so much. Uh, there's some other qualifications I'm looking at according to Acts chapter 6. But at the same point, and also Timothy and Titus also talk about this too for deacons and whatnot. But at the same point in time, uh, you know, the, the main criteria I'm looking for is faithfulness. I'll take someone. I'll take a janitor who's faithful. Over someone who is arrogant and haughty and, and has a chip on their shoulder. And uh, I'll take that any day. You know, and so um, I'll take, uh, I'm looking for a contrite spirit. I'm looking for someone who's faithful, faithful, faithful. And uh, I'm not saying perfect, I'm just saying faithful. And so, uh, we're, and, you know, uh, we're, 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 uh, none of us are perfect. No church is perfect, no pastor is perfect. Loss of Purdue, where Sherry kind of quoted from, if you come to his church, he says, if you come to my church looking for problems, you're going to find them. But if you come looking to the church looking for what's good, you're going to find that too. Yeah, but if that's on your list, if that's on your agenda, if that's that's what you're trying to imagine, like you're kind of like a, one of these detectives, you're looking for something wrong, you'll find it. You know? Uh, if that's what you're looking for, you're going to find it. You know, there's there's no perfect home, there's no perfect family, there's no perfect person, there's no perfect business, there's no perfect country, <laughs> there's no perfect uh, any, any, there's no perfect people. As Andrew will say many times, there's no one qualified working for him yet. <laughs> At the same point in time, you know, uh, uh, and, and there are places where we do draw the line on things, and I get that, but don't draw the line in the sand so prematurely, so hastily. You know, I would I would never leave a church hastily. That is a wrong attitude. Uh, there should be uh, there should be uh, direction from the Holy Spirit, and there should be prayerfulness prayerfulness in that. You know, so. and the the main thing through all of this is to have the right lens on uh, to take from what Dave's trying to say, and focus on God. We can trust the Holy Spirit to lead us. We can trust the Holy Spirit to, to show us what we are to believe and, and to teach us um, and to have peace and direction on where, which church we're to be, to be at. But our focus needs to be on God. It needs to be on what Jesus did, not on people. People fail. You know, I have good days and bad days, and yet I'm married to a man who can see past bad and love me anyways. That, that's what we're, we're to do with the body of Christ. We love you anyways. We're all sheep. We all have manure and baggage. But our, our focus needs to be on Jesus. You know, we, we uh, like to share about Jeremiah um, 17, about the cursed man and the blessed man. The cursed man, all he could see was what's wrong with his life. All the, all the curses that are, are going after him, all the bad things, the, the drought, the desert, the storm, that's all he could focus on. But the blessed man could only see the good, could only see the blessing because his focus was on God. They both had rain, they both had drought, they both had you know good and bad come their way. But the blessed man, uh, Jeremiah likens him to a, a tree uh, by water that is just so rich and fruitful and healthy because it's drawing from the stream. The, the, the blessed man is drawing from Jesus. He's so uh, rooted and grounded in God that, that, that that's his focus. And you know, that, that's, what, that's what our focus is. You know, we need to know what we believe to direct it back to Andrew's study. Okay, let's get to the next section. Better with love. That's a nice transition. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are meant to be operated in love. 
This explains why Paul wrote, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians 12.31 As he launched into his famous love passage, 1 Corinthians 13. Some people have tried to say that love is the more excellent way. However, the context clearly shows that all of Paul's comments concerning love in chapter 13 pertain specifically to the use of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are listed in chapter 12 and expounded on in chapter 14. His point was not that love is better than the gifts, but rather that operating the gifts in love is better than using them without it. The Holy Spirit doesn't control you like a puppet. He leads, guides, and inspires you to speak in tongues and operate the other gifts. But you are the one who actually does it. Therefore, it's possible to operate in the gifts carnally, make mistakes, and fail to be motivated by love. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 and 2. It doesn't matter which gift you're operating in, tongues, prophecy, faith, there's no benefit apart from the right motive. Therefore, let love motivate your use of every gift of the Spirit, including speaking in tongues. In fact, God's love should be the motivation for everything you do. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13.3 Whether you attend church because you feel you have to, or give into an offering out of sheer obligation, apart from love, it profits you nothing. From God's point of view, your motive is more important than your action. I like that. You know, man, it's so true. You know, bring it down back to the basics. You know, you know. I'm all for the gifts. I'm all for tongues. I'm all for the Holy Spirit. We don't do it enough. Uh, you know, Paul, in many ways, said the same thing in First Corinthians 14. I, I, I speak in tongues more than you all. I think we need to do it more. I think we need to operate the gifts more. All the gifts. Not just tongues, but all the gifts. At the same point in time, you know, if it's not done in love, it's just distasteful. You know? Um, and so, it just, I mean... There's some in, there's some recipes. If you don't have a certain ingredient in there, it's just not tasteful. I mean, uh, let me just get, I can give you a lot of examples, but our mashed potatoes. Sherry and I love garlic and we love pepper. Uh, I like pepper probably more than she does, but but we love garlic, and so we'll doctor that that puppy up. I mean, we'll just I mean we're generous. We're not chintzy. But there are some people that we do have mashed potatoes where they don't they don't appreciate all the garlic, so we have so we we skim back on it or don't even put it at all. And we, we do it out of love because we want them to enjoy the meal. But to me, those potatoes are just not tasty. Uh, they just don't have the same pizzazz as as they want with garlic, and you know it's just not the same, you know. And so um, I'm just using that as an example. It's just, you know, having a McDonald's burger, which I have not had in years, versus that In-N-Out burger, those of you know what In-N-Out is, it's just night and day. You know, one one to me is a real burger, the other one's a fake. And so, uh, I'll never order a, a McDonald's hamburger, uh, but I will order In-N-Out. I could have one every day. Some people can't do that every day, but I could. I did it for 10 years because I worked there. Uh, I almost had one every day. But anyway, I'm just trying to... You know, someone who the gifts can be are as awesome, as powerful as they are, and we need to operate more. That you ruin it. You can ruin it the whole moment if you don't have love. It just same. And he, I like how he ties in. It's the same with tithing and giving. If you give it out of obligation, but you don't have love, you might as well just keep your money. And if you, if you, you know, other, uh, what else did he? I uh, compare it to um, if you go to church. If you're going to church out of obligation, but you don't have love, then you might as well in one sense just stay home. And I'm not encouraging you to stay home. Don't get me wrong. 
If you need to be in church, if you have that your attitude, you probably should be in church. You need to be softened up. But at the same point in time, uh, you know, love. The motivation is key. You can do the right thing the wrong way. You can do the right thing with the wrong attitude. You can do the right thing without love. And it profits nothing. And, uh, you know, uh, there was one person, and I, I don't want to get on the bandwagon and negative things, but one person invited us to a theme park a few years ago. And when we got there, this person didn't want anything to do with us. We would rather just not have been invited. <laughs> Why invite us to something and don't want don't want anything to do with us? That, to me, that is the root of to the highest score. You know, it's just um, I would have rather we would have rather, rather have just stayed home. We would have rather just canceled the plans. But when you invite us to something and you and you treat us that way, uh, you know, it's that it, it was actually hurtful and, and, and whatnot. And so. I'm not trying to pick it back on that story. It's just, uh, uh, just one that came to my mind. It's just, you know, uh, love. Love never fails. And, uh, you know, there's some people, they've given me extravagant gifts without without love, and that they might as well kept the gift. And then there's some people, if, and probably compared to that gift, those gifts, gave me very... Uh, I hate using this word cheesy gifts, but they were done out of love. <coughs> and because they were done out of love, that gift was the most thoughtful, was the most glamorous gift out of the other gifts that were given out of obligation or expense. Or, or it, it, wasn't, it didn't have a value. But the ones that were done out of love uh, were just admired. They were cherished because there was a special ingredient in that recipe. <laughs> <coughs> it was called love, and uh, it just it was meaningful. Well, the other one lost its meaning because it was just done out of obligation. And uh, I'm I'm just trying to make some comparisons here with love, but uh, I don't maybe you're not connected with some of them. But I just uh, want to pick that. You know the 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 gifts that God gives us, uh, whether they be the administration gifts, uh, the fivefold ministry gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They're for the benefit of other people, the benefit of the body of Christ, the benefit of the world. And you, you can use different ones to minister to, to each one. But if I'm only doing it to show how spiritual I am or show how cocky I am. Or how uh, spirit-filled I am. You know, th that's not out of love. That's pointing the finger at you to say, look at me, when it's... I couldn't use any of these gifts uh, or have the, the gifts if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit. You know, what do you believe? We believe that Jesus rose from the, the dead and we only have the Holy Spirit and the gifts because of him, because of what Jesus did. You know, it's Jesus loving through me using these gifts to benefit and edify, uh, especially the body of Christ. And... I, I've seen people not do it in love. Uh, I've seen people use the gifts because they ha they've had to, or they've been prideful about because they have certain gifts. Or we've you know we've been to churches where they magnify the gift but not Jesus. Um, that, that that's wrong motivation. You know, uh, Paul was very sincere in explaining that um, the the best. Uh, the best way to do it is in love. And uh, it's it's interesting that, that Andrew even brings out giving, like uh, tithing or, or making gifts, you know, in the offering plate. Um, I struggled for years because I heard so many weird teachings. Growing up, I, I saw the, the plate being passed around for offering at church, but I never knew why. They never taught on it. So I'm just like, cool, you know, the church has bills. You know, obviously that's how the bills get paid. You know, as a kid, you know, what else are you to, you know, put two and two together and make four out of? Um, but then I would hear different things like, you're only going to be blessed if you give, or people uh, giving you a guilt trip that you have to give or else. Uh, that was all wrong. It made me not want to give. I didn't want to give when I heard wrong teaching. <coughs> but when God opened my eyes and the Holy Spirit taught me, 
but the joy and the love of giving, it's a delight. You know, it, it benefits uh, so many when you do it out of love and out of, out of joy. And, um, you know, the, using the gifts is the same thing. You know, use the gifts to bless people. You know, you want, you want to get a high off of drugs or chocolate or whatever people get high off of, you know, the, the best high is, is operating in, in the Holy Spirit and letting Jesus love through you. You're, you're going to have the best high uh, on the planet. You know, it just makes me think of, you know, Paul's teaching on, the, and I don't forget exactly how he said that, the, the hand can't say to the foot, I don't need you. You know, the, the, the hand, the head can't say to you, uh, the, the foot, I don't need you. And the list goes on, but and I know I'm saying probably the wrong body parts of what he mentions, but we need one another. You know, and the pastor's not more special than the janitor. You know, Andrew had a pretty big ministry, but Andrew could not do what he did without his team, without everyone who does everything they do. You know, the secretary, I mean, he has a lot of people on his team, without his staff. And some are paid, some are volunteered, I'm sure. And uh, But he can do anything without, he can do all that he does without them. You know, I, I think of always, I, I also thought of Aaron and her. And the first battle that Israel had when they came out of the Egypt, and Joshua was fighting the battle, and jo uh, Moses was keeping his arms up with the staff. And then when uh, Moses' arms got tired, uh, Joshua was losing the battle. When his arms were up, Joshua was winning the battle. Joshua was, and the, the, the soldiers were doing all the, the hard work as far as the battle was concerned, but it was dependent on Moses. But if Aaron and Hur did not step up, Josh, Moses would not have been able to keep his hands up, and Joshua would have never won the battle, and all Israel would have lost. The real heroes of that day were Aaron and Hur, including Moses and Joshua and all the armies. Everyone had a part to play, you know? And uh, the, the moms and, and the women had to keep care of the children and everything else. Everyone had a part to play. For that battle to be a victory, but uh, you know the real heroes in one sense were Aaron and her, who her job was just to keep their their arms up. But sometimes, you know, <coughs> I talked to a lot of pastors through the years, and we've had some. Uh, and we have a lot of good stuff to talk about, but we also have a lot of war stories too. And I've had we've had pastors cry in our ear, and cry on the phone because. They've just been beat up. Both Andrew and Barry Bennett, he's another teacher at, at Karis, both of them said they would never be a pastor again. Barry Bennett said he's like, a pastor's like being a, having a bullseye on your back. You know, they, they're ministers, but they're not pastors. And uh, what's my point? I'm just getting on a side trail for just a second. Just encouraging. I mean, uh, yes, you, your pastor is here to serve you and different things. And other people in your church are here to serve you and different things. That's a... That's a that the word minister means to serve. At the same point in time, you can also serve them. Aaron and her served Moses and Joshua so they can win the battle. And sometimes, it, you know, uh, uh, that, that can make your day. You know, I, I, uh, I'll share this one more story and then I'll transition, but uh, I, w I was going through a rough time back uh, just before I met Sherry. I had an engagement that broke off and I was feeling sorry for myself for my birthday. This was probably back in uh, 99, uh, I believe it was, 99. But anyway, I was feeling sorry for myself. Uh, I just started going to a new church as a youth pastor. And I was feeling sorry for myself. One, the breakup was still tender. And then, uh, uh, and then I was all alone in my dark apartment. I didn't have a light bulb. Uh, it was dark. and I was just feeling sorry for myself. And I just started this youth pastor, but one of my youth uh, called me up. They actually, there was three youths of this one family, but one of them called me up and said, Hey, pastor, what are you doing today? And I didn't tell them what I was really doing. I was just moping and <laughs> feeling sorry for myself and uh, crying half the time. And they just said, uh, we would like you to, we'd like to take you out for your birthday. You know, now I was crying for another reason, because now I felt love. Here I was supposed to be ministering to them, and they were ministering to me. And I got off, I got off my, you know, the Bible talks about ash, uh, sackcloth and ashes. I kind of took my sackcloth and ashes out, off, got on some decent clothes, and, and took the, and I was actually about an hour away from them. 
because uh, I was going to be moving in to, uh, closer to the area, but I hadn't moved yet. And uh, so I moved, had to drive an hour or two down, and then we just had a good old time. And my point was, you know, here I was thinking I, I'm going to change their lives, and they were changing mine. And, uh, you know, that's, that's awesome. That's just awesome. You know, uh, and that's just my story. And there's other stories I could tell about other people and different things. And uh, Andrew could tell you hundred, hundreds of stories like that. Andrew could not. His staff makes Andrew look good. And if it wasn't for his staff, I could tell you all these ministers, uh, it's their staff that makes them look half as good as they do. And so, uh, because that's their role. Uh, not everyone's called to be an Andrew Walmer. Not everyone's called to be, but we're all called to be the body of Christ. And so, and the gifts, multiple different kinds of gifts are you use. And one gift is not more important than the other. They're all important. But none of them are important if they're not done with love. And so, and so, anyway, you want to take it back on anything? Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's read the next section. How are we doing time? Good. Yeah, we got about 15 minutes left. So uh, uh, I think until that which is perfect. <coughs> Excuse me, let me read that again. Until that which is perfect has come. People who reject the baptism in the Holy Spirit twist 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 10 in order to support their position that tongues passed away with the early church. Charity never faileth. And just a side note, uh, some Bible translations uh, say charity instead of love, but we're talking about love here. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. They claim that God only gave the gifts of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, prophecy, gifts of healing, working of miracles, etc., to the early church because the Bible wasn't written yet. Asserting that the Bible is that which is perfect, they justify their conclusion that God doesn't do these things anymore. Nonsense. If you read that passage in its context, you can easily see what it's really saying. Remember, Paul's subject for this entire section of Scripture, 1 Corinthians 12-14, is properly operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He just finished saying that the gifts should be used in love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, describe what that looks like. Then in verse 8, the word states that when tongues cease, knowledge will too. Living in what's been popularly called the information age, you and I both know that this hasn't happened yet. In fact, God's word prophesies that in the end times, knowledge will greatly increase. Daniel 12, 4. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. 1 Corinthians 13, 9 through 12. The then in verse 12 refers to, refers to when that which is perfect has come. At the time when that which is perfect has come, you will see Jesus face to face. Since that won't happen until the Lord's second coming, or you die and go to be with him, neither has tongues passed away yet. That which is perfect refers to your glorified body, not the Bible. Yes, the Bible is perfect, inspired, inerrant, infallible. But it's not what this phrase is pointing to. When you receive your glorified body, you will no longer see through a glass darkly or know in part. In your glorified body, you will see Jesus face to face and know him even as he knows you, completely. For now, speaking in tongues has been given to help you grow in the knowledge of Him. In your glorified body, you won't need tongues or the other gifts of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy, the word of wisdom, discerning of spirits, interpretation of tongues, etc. to reveal the Lord anymore, because you'll already know Him fully. The very scriptures people use to dismiss the gifts of the Holy Spirit actually prove their validity for today. As long as your knowledge of Him is incomplete, the gifts of the Spirit will function. 
Until you see Jesus face to face in your glorified body, you need to be speaking in tongues. Since that which is perfect has yet to come, God's miraculous power continues on earth today just as it did for the early church. You would have to already be corrupted with a predisposed religious mindset in order to honestly look at these scriptures and interpret them as saying, God's miraculous power has passed away. Brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. 1 Corinthians 14.39 Well, I don't know how clear you can be. And, uh, you know, Andrew's right, you know, how did he put it? He said, you would have to be, have to be already be corrupted with a, uh, uh, predisposed religious mindset in order to honestly look at these scriptures and interpret them as saying, God's miraculous power has passed away. I mean, that's just, uh, 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 it's a corrupted mind. Uh, it's clear. Forbid not to speak in tongues until that which is perfect has come. That which is perfect has not come yet. And we will be speaking in tongues. Uh, there will be a day we will see Jesus face to face. There will be a day when we know all things. That day hasn't come yet. That day is still coming. And so the gifts the Holy Spirit has been poured out on our flesh today. And to, to and that's just some of the scriptures I'm just uh, echoing from Andrew Womack. But if you were listening... To all that was being said here, you know, if you, if it would take a religious, a corrupted religious mindset to interpret this any other way, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just, I'm just being forward, you know, and uh, uh, because sometimes you just gotta shake the tree, you know, but uh, it just, uh, um, it, I don't see how you can be any clearer, um, and some people don't know this because they've never studied the Word of God like we were talking about. They've never have. Uh, and so, a lot of pastors are not teaching on First Corinthians 14 and, uh, and surrounding scriptures and whatnot. People aren't teaching this and, and whatnot. And so it's just, uh, uh, they're basing their theology, they're basing their stance, they're basing the rejection of the Holy Spirit in tongues based on no teaching, based on wrong teaching, or based on uh, just uh, a, a corrupted religious mindset. And so I'm not trying to, again, not trying to be mean, but that's just the way I see it. And, uh, anything you want to add to that? Uh, other than amen, <laughs> I I really thought that was uh, very wonderful how how Andrew explained that. And I encourage you, uh, if you're still confused, to reach out and ask him questions uh, or reread that scripture if you have the book. Yeah, uh, if you don't have the book, I'll, you know, send me an email or something on the website. I'll I'll retype that chapter for, or that section of that chapter for you to read. Uh, for yourself, I'll even send you a book uh, if you if you uh, if you send payment for it. But anyway, uh, he just uh, uh, anyway, it's just uh, it's very clear. Andrew does a, a very very well job of explaining that using the Word of God as his foundation for what he just said. And, and you know, a, another good teaching to help uh, validate all of this is Andrew's teaching on the spirit, soul, and body. Uh, that will help you understand uh, even more clear um, how we can only see in part right now because when you're a believer the only saved part of you right now since Jesus hasn't come yet or you're not uh, in, in heaven because you've passed away your spirit's the only perfect and saved part of you you are a three part being you are a spirit, a soul and a body and your body still has a, it, its hiccups. Your spirit, which is your mind, will, and emotions. No, soul. What? I'm, your soul. Your soul, excuse me. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. Your mind is still uh, messed up in trying to grasp things of God. That, that knowledge that, that Dave and Andrew are talking about. You're still trying to figure things out and believe. And, um, you know, go on our website. Uh, Dave has uh, Andrew's um, videos on spirit, soul, and body that are an illustrated uh, explanation of and Andrew's teaching. Uh, Andrew has uh, almost all of Andrew's teachings, if not all, are based on spirit, soul, and body. So, you know, there, he has a book, he has teachings, he has the videos. Uh, Pastor Lawson Purdue also teaches on spirit, soul, and body, and his teachings are awesome. You know, our website has, has 
uh, Bible classes and different things for you to uh, either re uh, blogs and things for you to either read or take the Bible classes and listen to either Dave's teachings. Uh, so you we and again reach out if you have questions or more clarification. But again that that uh, section of Andrew's book Andrew is very clear and explains it very well. So anyways. Right. Good stuff. Uh, let's read this last section of chapter 13, uh, Miraculous Proof. Why do some people fight so hard against the truth that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and His miraculous power is for today? Two main reasons are wrong teaching and a rejection of personal responsibility. Doctrines of men can render the Word of God ineffective. That's what happens when you hold on to religious tradition instead of God's word, Mark 7, 13. Also, there's a fear of having to produce biblical results. If you profess to believe in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, casting out demons, healings, and, mir and miracles, then that puts pressure on you to manifest them, Mark 16, 17, and 18. Most people don't want to accept this kind of personal responsibility. Instead, many hide behind a convenient theology calling themselves Christian, they quickly confess that their sins are forgiven while their lives offer very little proof. It's easy to profess my sins are forgiven because you can't see a sin and you can't see when it's forgiven. However, if miracles are really part of the Christian life, then there are things you can do to prove the reality. For instance, if you, you can speak in tongues, cast a demon out, see blind eyes and deaf ears open, or even raise someone from the dead, I have personally done all of these things on multiple occasions and know many others who have, who have done them as well. To God be the glory. In order to sit in front of the television, living carnal, self-centered lives, while defending their position of being forgiven, these people choose to believe only what God's word says about forgiveness of sins while conveniently ignoring the rest. They may or may not truly be saved. Who would know? Jesus used miracles to prove salvation. Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but th that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. Mark 2, 9-11 Confronted by believing in religious leaders, Jesus asked them which would be harder to say, your sins are forgiven, or take up your bed and walk. No one can see a sin forgiven, but everyone in that crowded room, including the Pharisees, would be able to see if this man was healed or not. Either he would get up and walk, or Jesus' words would be totally violated. Therefore, take up your bed and walk was definitely harder to say. The people knew if Jesus could, could, could perform that which was hardest, surely he could do the least. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God. Mark 2.12 Jesus used the fact that he could heal bodies and perform miracles in the physical realm to substantiate the fact that he could also do things like forgiving sins in the spiritual realm. The reason many people hide behind this false doctrine that miracles passed away is so they can claim to be in relationship with God without ever doing anything to demonstrate it. That's just a convenient theology. The truth is that God still does miracles today, and you should be speaking in tongues until you receive your glorified body. That's awesome. You know, so uh, we should be seeing miracles. You know, the, the church as a whole. Uh, has done a disservice to our world. Half, most of the problems that are going on in our world today, in our government, is because the church has been complacent, complacent and passive. And I'm not here to be political. But we should be seeing miracles. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. We are blessed and not cursed. We should be blessed coming in and blessed going out. We are the church of the living God. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We should be setting an example. The world should be following us, not the other way around. 
We should not be poor as a church mouse. We should not, we should be being an example. He says in that same context that I just quoted, we should be a lender to many and a borrower of none. <coughs> and that's just talking about finances. I mean, but there's other things that we should we should be able to say, uh, silver and gold I have not, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. We should be operating the power of the Holy Holy Spirit. But Andrew so rightly says. A lot of people don't do this because it puts the responsibility on you. You need, we, we, It means taking a step of faith or a leap of faith for some people. But either you believe it or you don't. And so we, you know, it's easier to tell someone <coughs> to receive Christ and their sins are forgiven. If they'll receive it, it's, it seems to, it puts, it, it, it would be embarrassing to tell someone to rise up and walk and they don't rise up and walk. You can't. Outside the Word of God, you can't prove to someone that their 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 sins are forgiven, but you can prove to someone that they're healed. You know, uh, I mean, uh, I just think of John G. Lake and uh, Wigglesworth, for example. They're a little more modern in our <coughs> times. I know they're still before uh, they're not alive now, but you know, uh, Kathy Coleman was another one. Uh, just uh, some of these. I mean, they just they did, especially Wiggles was did some bizarre things. And I, you know, that go beyond some of our comfort zones and now with all kinds of laws and whatnot. But Wiggles was, had more fear of God than he did man. John G. Lake, you know, talking about COVID and the plague. There was a plague going on and, and he, he would, I mean, John G. Lake emptied hospitals so much that they gave him a doctor's license. Uh, he emptied hospitals. And, uh, but there was a plague going on, and he was part of the team to help minister to the sick. And uh, uh, all the doctors, all the, the, the ones helping out, uh, had taken the antidote, or me medication to, to, uh, to um, help uh, protect them and get, so they don't catch the plague. And John Zulek didn't, and he wasn't wearing gloves, and he wasn't, wasn't wearing a mask and all this stuff. And one of the other doctors or whatnot says, you mean you... Uh, you're not even wearing a mask or whatnot. And John G. Lake and said, and I might be chopping the story up just a little bit on the mask and stuff, uh, but but I, know, I just know he, he wasn't he wasn't taking all the precautions that the other doctors were. I do know that. I forget what exactly which precautions they were. But he says, this plague, this disease cannot get on my body and live. He says, I'm going to prove it to you. And they put the, a swab of the, the disease under a microscope. And he touched it with his bare finger, and that disease died on the spot. It's not like John G. Lake is an incarnate Christ. He just believed the gospel. He believed the word of God. He believed that he was the uh, that, that 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 disease could not live on his body. Why? Because by his stripes we were healed. John G. Lake, we can do the same thing, but the difference is John G. Lake believed it. Wigglesworth believed it. And so, if we believe the gospel, if we believe Jesus, if you believe your, <coughs> if you believe your sins are forgiven, and how do you believe your sins are forgiven? Because the word of God says it. How do you know that you can heal the sick and raise the dead? The word of God says it. The same word that says you're forgiven is the same word that says by his stripes you are healed. It's the same sad word. The word, the word is true. Again, let all... Let man be, let God be true and every man a liar. We either believe this or we don't. <coughs> I believe that God, my God will supply my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I, either I believe it or I don't. Either he's your Lord or your sickness is your Lord or your finances and the lack of is your Lord or whatever the case may be. Jesus is my Lord. He's my master. He's my provider. He's my salvation. He's my God. And I believe his word. And I can go do what he said I can go do. I can, go, I can be who God says I can be. And I can, and uh, I love Lost and Produce. If I can do what God's called me to do, I can be who God's called me to be. I have favor with God and favor with man and a good understanding. And he, he just, he, I mean, you get, you'll get Lost and, if you just tell, tell Lost and he can't do something, or you'll, get, you'll get him fired up. He says, by golly, I will. I'll do what God's called me to do. And he said, I will never make a decision based on finances. I'm going to make a decision based on hearing from God. And if I, 
you know, Jesus wanted to feed the, the multitudes twice. And he wasn't, he, he didn't have the money. He didn't have, even if they, he didn't have, a, he didn't even have a lunch. He used the boys' lunch and he fed the multitudes with 12 baskets left over. We can do what Jesus can do because the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is awesome, folks. We are living, we're like Beth Moore who taught the duck that's, that's waiting in, uh, in, a, in a mud puddle while on the other side of the hill there's a big ocean, there's a big lake. We are settling, we have settled for too little and we have deprived the world of the miraculous. We have at our disposal. We can ha operate in the power <coughs> of the Holy Spirit and we should. And the world is waiting for us. There's a verse in uh, Romans 8 that talks about how uh, all creation is waiting for the sons of God to manifest. All creation is waiting for us to get this and manifest God's word. Joseph Prince teaches that very well. And so anyway. Um, and there's other verses that say they preach the gospel and signs and wonders follow. And, you know, I, most of us, I think, or I hope most of us know uh, Romans 1 16 that when Paul says for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek you know the power of God is is the gospel it's, it's salvation and God not only is the same yesterday and is today but he doesn't change you know whatever he did miracles in the Old Testament he will do miracles today if we let him, if we believe. You know, that's why miracles happen. It's because people believe. And uh, for, for us to, to give God a disservice by saying, oh, it's not for today, or God doesn't do them anymore, that's a, those are big, fat lies from the pit of hell. You know, God, God has already healed on Jesus Christ at the cross. Why we don't see healing is because we don't believe it. Uh, same as all the other signs and, and miracles. You know, we, we have seen ministers um, and even people who aren't ministers as far as like having a title uh, live out signs and wonders and, and heal people because they believed. They believe in the gospel that is the power of God into salvation. They believe that Jesus Christ died for us and rose again. They believe God's word. They're not believing the word or someone saying, oh, it doesn't happen today because I haven't seen it. Well, you know, you can't always base it off people's opinion or experience. their experience. Thank you. Uh, we have to go back to what, how Andrew faced it. Who do you believe? You know, we, so many times we think we're waiting on God. No, God's waiting on us. <laughs> he's already moved. He moved at the cross. Now he's given he us his Holy Spirit and empowered us to go do the ministry, to do the work of the ministry. And we're, uh, God's not waiting. We're not waiting on God. He's not the one stuck. We are. <laughs> and so, you know, it's not a, it's a, it seems like a low blow to some people. But, you know, church, we need to wake up. We need to wake up and just waiting for God. We, but Jesus told us to go to all the world and preach the gospel. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast them. He told us to go. And the church, you know, COVID and all this stuff, you know, I believe in the assembling of the church. I'm not in agreement with a lot that's going on in our, in our country and our, <coughs> on our world with the church. But... None of that's going to just stop us from going. We're supposed to go. Yes, there's a part about our assembly. Don't get me wrong. But at the same point in time, the church is not an organization. It's not a building. It's a people. And, uh, and so we can go do what God's called us to go do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And, Jesus, and we should see signs and wonders following us. And sorry, Jesus Himself gave us this. <coughs> he gave us the authority. He He gave us the um, uh, what do you call it? He, he He basically gave us an order to go do it. Commission. Commission. Thank you. 
uh, it, I mean, if Jesus gave me something, you know, I, I want to use it. I want to do it. He specifically told us to go and do. You know, I, I want to just read, read in closing from Mark 16. It says, And he, Jesus, said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. You know what every creature means? Every creature. You know, he's not talking about go preach the gospel to your dog or cat. That's not what he's talking about, but every person, okay? He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. There's that tongues part again. They will uh, take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. And so, there's a lot of things that should follow us who believe. And some things, and I have to say, in a lot of our churches, and including our, our own lives at times, you know, I want to see more. I need to see more. I, we've settled for too little. And we need to experience more in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed us to heal the broken hearts and set the captives free. There's a captives free. What does that mean? To me, the way, way I take that, that's not the only way I take that. There's, I could spend all day talking about uh, Isaiah 61. But there's a lot of people in bondage of sickness, disease, uh, addictions of all kinds, depression, uh, anger. All kinds of emotions that are unhealthy. It's time for to set them free. It's time to heal the brokenhearted. The people are just broken. It's time to heal them. It's time to uh, put the oil of joy instead of the uh, heaviness, spirit of heaviness. It's time to set the people free. It's time to blow the trumpet of jubilee and forgive one another and, and, and pardon one another and wash one another's feet. Even if we have to do it 70 times 7 in one day. Now, there's, there's no expiration. There's no sin. There's no fault that we can't forgive. We grieve the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 4, when we don't forgive one another, when we don't treat one another right. We grieve His Spirit. And so, anyway, there's things that we... There's a world that needs Jesus. And they need to be healed. And they need to be set free. And one of the bells, one of the biggest signs that they're going to know that this gospel is true is, <coughs> is signs and wonders and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the ways that we can magnify and bring attention to this gospel that we preach. I don't want people to get healed and not receive Christ. But the, more, the greatest miracle of all is someone who's born again. But signs and wonders can be used. Forgiving somebody can change someone's life. I mean, just forgiving someone. I mean, it's just, uh, it just awesome, you know, because it's foreign in our country. We live in a world, my right, my right, my right, my right. That is the most arrogant, selfish attitude on the face of this planet. We gave all of our rights up. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm no longer, longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I'm here to serve one another. I'm here to, to get, it's not about my rights. That, that's selfish to the core. That's self-centeredness, what we were talking the other night on. You know, that's self-centered. That's focus on you. And so, uh, who died and made you king? I mean, it's just uh, God's on the throne. And that's exalting yourself above God. Because we gave all those rights up. I'm not saying any of us should be a doormat and all this stuff. I'm not talking about that. Uh, but but we're here. Even if we have to turn the other cheek, uh, we, we, we do it. And so we serve one another. We love our enemies. We do good to those who do us bad. That living coal will be on their heads. We don't do it out of, out of spite. Again, that goes back to the attitude that we were talking about earlier. You don't do it out of love. You know, we do it out of love. And, you know, Corey Tim Boone said it this way, you can do all you want to me, but you can't make me hate. You can't make me hate. Uh, I choose to love. You know, love, there's all kinds of forms for love. There's all kinds of different wor Greek words for love.
But the word agape in a noun is not a verb. It's a noun. It's a person. His name is Jesus. And you can choose to love. Uh, you know, love is a choice. And you can choose who this day you will serve. You know, even if, uh, so to the flesh you'll have the flesh reap corruption, but so to the spirit you'll reap life and life and peace. And I choose to walk in the spirit. I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. My flesh lusts for some things. Sometimes my flesh wants to get back at people, but the spirit doesn't. The spirit will show mercy and forgiveness. And so some people deserve your wrath, but they need mercy. They deserve, we all deserve hell. But we all have received mercy by his grace. He's an awesome, awesome God. Receive it and give that mercy and grace to others who need it as well. That is his goodness that's going to cause people to repent. It's not your wrath. It's going to be your goodness that will cause people to repent. And so. Lord, we just thank you. We worship you. We magnify you. Lord, uh, teach us afresh what it means to be the church. Teach us afresh what it means to be filled with your spirit. So we can operate as a church in this hour, in this day. Amid all the evil going on in our world, it's time for the church to arise. <coughs> Lord, help us. Help us to Believe your word and operate in the power of your spirit in this hour. We pray for our country. We pray for our world. We pray for our state and our local governments. And we, uh, Lord, we pray that they would come to a, 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 a knowledge of you. We pray for revival to start with your church. That will spread to each of our cities and state and our country and the world. Let us start with the church, loving one another and, and believing your word and walking in your spirit in the power of your might. In Jesus' name we give you thanks. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you on Sunday as we uh, talk about knowing uh, the Holy Spirit. And then Sunday night we're going to start a new book. Uh, effortless change on Sunday night. So we'll start a new book. Okay. God bless you guys.